um, the, the end times of this world, we hope. <laughs> and Isaiah was in a similar position in end time for his people. He knew it, they didn't. Um, and this first lesson is called Crisis of Identity. And it asks some very good questions. I know we've talked about it before. Uh, who are we? Where, where do we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? And that's something that's very important to think about. And it helps to guide our decisions. It helps to, to, to guide uh, our activities, our plans for the future. Uh, we believe we are people of God. And what, what does that really mean? Is it just a name? You know, when you fill out a box on demographics, you know, what religion are you? You check off Christian, you could fill in Seventh-day Adventist. What, what does that mean? What, is, what does identity mean? Of course, the memory verse is a summary of, of how God is offering to us. In, in, in our breakout room, we talked about Christianity and uh, how that never changes. And, and this is the principle of, of Christianity and of Jesus that I believe that does not change. And that is the principle of forgiveness. Uh, we are sinners. Our skins are like our sins are scarlet, and through the miracle of salvation, they become white as snow. Um, so our sins are forgiven. We are treated as if we've never sinned. And um, God says, "Come now, let us reason together," says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. <laughs> So Isaiah starts off with, um, let's look at Isaiah. You can leave your, your Bibles open to Isaiah, pretty much this whole lesson. And if somebody could look up Isaiah 1 and just read verses 2 and 3. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So God starts out by saying, people have forgotten um, it's hard to imagine, but uh, people have forgotten where they came from, who they belong to. And when I started reading this, I thought about this, this children's book that, that maybe you're familiar with, Are You My Mother? And it talks about uh, a baby bird who somehow gets hatched while the mother is away. And this poor little baby bird doesn't know who he belongs to. So he flies around to all these different animals asking, are you my mother? He flies to a cow. Are you my mother? And the cow says, no, I'm a cow. I'm not your mother, etc." cetera. And, and so, you know, I think this is a, a, a fun children's book because we generally know who our mothers are. Um, maybe not when we're babies, but as we get older and, and babies, even before they can communicate, obviously they know who their mother is. And, and you can tell if you've ever tried to pick up a baby who's not yours, they, they pretty much immediately start screaming because they can, they can tell by your touch, your smell, uh, that you're not their mother. So that's something that, that people in Isaiah's day had forgotten. And, um, and God was trying to tell them, you know, even, even the animals know who they belong to. They know their owner. But Israel, God's people did not understand. Why, why, why do you think, why, why did they forget? I always think that the Israelites took on too much of the Egyptians. You know, they, they lived there. They, that was what they wanted to be like perhaps because they are the lower class you know the slaves and all that so as they marvel at the riches and the the glitter of of the of the egyptians 
they probably, that's why they were so unhappy with everything. Uh, if they had been humble, the manna would have been, uh, uh, you know, amazing and they would have just eaten it happily. But they were remembering, you know, what they saw in the other society they lived in. Yeah. It's that, not just neighboring, started, they were living inside, yeah. right? It started early on while they were, they were wandering in the wilderness. You know, they wanted to go back to Egypt, even though they were slaves there. They missed the various aspects of this um, affluent culture. society. Yeah, the culture. And, and even though they were slaves, they, they, I guess they kind of enjoyed it vicariously. I mean, they weren't, they weren't privy to all of the privileges that, that the, their Egyptian masters had, but they, they could at least sit there and <laughs> watch. Watch, yeah, you they know, probably that's... wanted that. Yeah. That's that's they, a great... they, their heart desire that and, and not the, the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great point, and and it, it it's it's not unique to Israel actually if you think about it. Um, that's the way we are. We 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 see the world. It looks so appealing on the surface, and you know we we've our church has changed. Our schools have changed. I mean, I'm not going to make a judgment on, on good or bad, but, but they've changed because we, we, um, we wander after the world. When, when my sister and I were younger, we, we took this, I, I think we were talking about the other day, how children don't always um, understand words completely. So, so I think we were, we were reading these verses that the, the children of Israel wandered, uh, wandered after the world. And so we thought that was wondered. And so we kept on thinking, what does that mean? They want, but it's, I mean, it's similar. They, they wondered and they wandered after the world. And, and I think it's unfortunately our nature to do the same thing. Um, we can't help it. We can't help it. I mean, um, it is what it is. <laughs> what, what can I say? <laughs> the, the reason that we, we buy things, the, the reason we dress a certain way, the reason we live in houses that are a certain way. It's it's because that's the, what the world tells us is important, and it's a sign of success. It's, um, it's the society. It's the society, society that the pressure, intense pressure. Yeah, they, pressure. they tell mm -hmm. us what we can and what we cannot do, and what we can accomplish if we, you know. And then the simplicity of life with your pets and your family, or just, you know, seems like ages ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And unless we experience that simplicity in our lives in the past, I remember my happiest time was in the countryside with my grandparents' mm -hmm. farm, you yeah. know, milking the cows, picking up the fresh fruits, uh, trying to, collecting the eggs. That was yeah. amazing. Yeah. But the children but, don't experience that anymore. No, it's, a, it's a totally different value system. And we try so hard. And I, I remember talking with um, Dr. Randall Wisby, who was the president of La Sierra. And, and he was saying, you know what, we're the values we're trying to teach in our Seventh Avenue educational system, they fly in the face. They, they're the absolute opposite of what the world teaches. You know, the world teaches it's important to be successful and famous and rich um, and accomplish a lot and get awards. And I mean, it's not that we're against it. It's just that, that you know, our view as Seventh Avenue is that we are here on this earth for a short period as stewards of God and any kind of glory or riches or fame we gain here, it, it, it doesn't, it's not something we can take with us to eternity, but it's a, it's a hard concept to grasp and I digress. So let, let's go on. But yes, we, we are all prone to forgetfulness of who we belong to and why we're here and what is our purpose. So, so Isaiah talks about, well, he's bringing God's message. Uh, when did Isaiah live? I had to look up actually, because the Bible, as you know, is not exactly in chronological order. And sometimes it's a bit confusing. Um, so Isaiah occurs after, you know, David's books, David and David, the Psalms, and then of course Solomon's books. But um, then there's the book of Isaiah, but then you have to jump back to Kings and Chronicles. So um, who were the Kings that were in power when Isaiah lived? Hezekiah 
Well, Hezekiah was the only one that I remembered because I remembered the, uh, you know, Hezekiah was going to die and he prayed and, and, and Isaiah said, okay, God's going to let you. So, but there were actually, if, I'm just going to flip back to 2 Kings 15. And if you've read through Kings and Chronicles, it's, it, you, you almost get um, whiplash from, from the kings, the good kings and the, the bad kings. So they go up and down and up and down, obeying God, following God, and then apostatizing. So, so if you go from uh, 2 Kings 15, uh, so King Azariah or Uzziah, he did right in the sight of the Lord. And, um, and then there were other kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord. So there's uh, Azariah and then Zechariah who did evil and then Menahem. Anyway, Isaiah lived a long time. So he lived through all these various kings. Ahaz. Um, so he, he lived up, in, I believe, until Hezekiah. So, so Isaiah did not witness he was not alive when israel uh, was taken captive into babylon um but it sounds like he knew that was coming and throughout the book of isaiah there were all of these warnings from god uh, and isaiah of course was one in the long line of prophets to israel that, that was trying to warn of god's of god's uh, coming um punishments and what were the sins of judah actually what what Daisy was talking about. Um, what were the sins of Judah, really? Uh, Marilyn, if, if I could just kind of make a kind of a historical, um, easier to understand. Yes, uh, um, Isaiah lived in the country, the nation of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Uh, they had, uh, in the times of David and Solomon, after Solomon, they split into two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom, which took on the name of Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which took on the name of Judah. And the northern kingdom was always uh, um, further away from God. Uh, the southern kingdom was always closer to God because the temple was there in Jerusalem. Uh, what you find in the time of, uh, of Isaiah is that you have a lot of many turnovers of regimes in the northern kingdom and all of their kings all almost all of their kings are bad and terrible and getting worse and then in judah you have occasional um not as frequent turnovers but um israel the northern kingdom fell to the assyrians and they were scattered all about and most of their people were taken to different lands uh during the time of isaiah uh, what's what's very confusing is that Judah is the southern kingdom, but they still call themselves the children of Israel. So you, you have to be careful you don't confuse the northern kingdom of Israel with the spiritual. I think we, Pastor Ivan, we lost the last few minutes, last few words yeah uh, okay well yeah we ha we can't don't want to confuse the the northern kingdom of israel with the spiritual uh israel that judah claimed to be israel yes yes the children no, of israel uh, excuse me i think one thing i want to clarify here if you go to the chapter one okay chapter one why on the 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 early, you know, two and three, right? Two and three. If you read carefully, there is talk about God. God of the Israel. This is an overall general term. Like today, many people this refer to the Jewish Israel. So, so with the North and South Kingdom was at that time the Isaiah was. And one thing also we had to know the north, the capital is Samaria. And the south, the capital is Jerusalem. They are very close. 
less than 60 kilometer. So what happened? This is why in the verse one, we are not paying attention. If you read the verse one, you look at here, so many things it told you, tell you, but many things they didn't tell you also. Actually, over there, they talk about four king, but this is not true. It's a five king, Malasi. Malasi is the, Malasi was the last king Isaiah served. And also, according to the early uh, the scholar, find out Isaiah was killed by Malasa. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah is the only prophet among the four, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. All the other three, they died in the overseas, not overseas, uh, foreign land, okay? Only Isaiah died in Judah, only one. And also interesting, you know, in the Hebrew, something sidetrack, Hebrew doesn't look at Daniel is the prophet. They put the Daniel in the history book, okay? So, but this is, a, you know, this is another story. But what I'm saying here, the worst one tell you something and also didn't tell you other thing. And if you read the Bible, Isaiah, very carefully, the message also for the Northern Kingdom, not only for Judah. And Isaiah saw the uh, Northern Kingdom fell to the Esther, okay? So he saw it, he know it. So if you read the Isaiah, it's sometimes they bring you the message, it talk about the, the Northern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom is almost hopeless, but the Judah Kingdom, he hope still some way to get out the future problem. Right. That was that was his purpose to try to try to save Judah. And and what what were the sins of Judah? What what did they do that that um, caused them to to leave God? What was the most common thing that, that Judah and Israel did that was a symbol of their uh, apostasy? It was something that all the nations around them did. They worship idols. So. Worship idols. I mean, that was the, the thing that set uh, Judah apart from the other nations is that they believed in one God. Uh, they didn't believe in multiple gods. They didn't believe that animals were gods and they, they didn't believe that you could, I mean, it, it goes back to the 10 commandments that um, Moses was given. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Um, but despite those 10 commandments, which, which were in the, the tabernacle, um, they were so tempted to become like other nations, the surrounding nations. Uh, and again, this, this speaks to what we, what we were talking about. I guess it's human nature to want to be like everybody else. And when we had our uh, breakout group about present truth, we were talking about, you know, sometimes truth becomes revealed to one person and then another and eventually to the group. But at the same time, just because everyone else is doing it, doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's, you know, present truth anyway. But I just wanted to bring out the point that the sins of Judah, it, they repeat it um, through this cycle of kings. And obviously the king is the leader and, and the king can lead the, the people away from God or toward God. Uh, as much as we are independent human beings with free will and free choice, it is very common for people, all of us, to follow the leader. And so even when there was an evil king or a king apostate, there were always a few within the country that, that did not follow. And they often were persecuted and sometimes killed. But um, in general, the, the, fate, the fate of the, the nation of Judah followed the decisions of the king. 
Um, so let's look, let's jump a few verses ahead. Actually, let's start with Isaiah 1, verse 10, and then go on to verse 11. Which verse? I start with verse 10. Okay, until 10 and 11? Yes. Uh -huh. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of ram and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. So verse 10, it's, uh, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, the people of Gomorrah. What, what kind of uh, tone of, of phrase is that? What is the connotation of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, I think here God is trying to say, uh, I'm giving you a warning and I'm giving you a chance. Otherwise you will end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, I, you know, the people at, at that time, um, we, we think it's mostly oral history, but, but I mean, they knew what Sodom and Gomorrah represented, didn't they? They would have been told the stories of their um, forefathers Abraham, you know, Isaac, and they would have known the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it, it should have jolted them to hear that, uh, to be, be called uh, an inhabitant of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's an, it's an insult. I mean, it, 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 um, it should have brought to mind, you know, what, what that represented. And then the surprising thing is, despite all the sacrifices. I mean, during the time that whenever the, the uh, country went into apostasy, the priests continued in the tabernacle offering sacrifices uh, just as they, they had always done. And what is God telling them about those sacrifices, the, the rituals? They're going through the motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they, they are they are sinful, their hearts are not there, but they just they just go through what they have been doing all through the all through right. the years. It's going right. to the ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He even says that he, he doesn't delight on the on the blood of the animals. And that's not what he's looking for. Right. The killing of the animals, yeah. And the way he talks about, I mean, these were very actually, these were sacred rituals to the people. They, they thought they were, um, you know, performing everything that God told them. I mean, God told Moses and they were following the instructions given um, that, you know, they had followed for, for hundreds of years. But here God is saying, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Their incense is an abomination. I hate your festivals, your feasts. They've become a burden. I'm weary. Uh, so, so that's that's a shocking thing for, for God to say to them because it, here it, they thought they were following all the rules. Um, yeah, but what? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, sorry. It, it's more than just that it was ritualistic. They were coming at it from a perspective that it was meritorious for themselves. That by doing it, they earned the favor of God. Yeah. And then what, what did God want them want? What does God desire instead of rituals? Somebody can look up Isaiah chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Sixteen. What wash you? Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. So, a, a cleansing. I think a yeah. cleansing of our life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
he, he wants he wants to actually wash yourself, make yourself clean. He's talking about our hearts, not necessarily our bodies. He's talking about our hearts and minds. He wants he wants um, not to go through the motions like we were talking about, not to go through the motions, not to earn our our salvation from from doing works um, uh, and rituals. But I thought it's interesting what he says. In verse 17, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And, you know, many times in the Bible, God talks about the widow and the orphan because, you know, those are special classes of people. But the, the bottom line from, from this verse is he wants people to have clean hearts, to be kind, to be unselfish, to not stand for injustice. And, and those, those are the things that mean a lot to God, uh, mean everything actually, not, not the rituals. And so when we think about how can we apply that now in 2021, I think it's pretty much the same as you were just saying, to care for the needy and to um, put things in pers perspective, you know? Uh, it's not how much money you donate, I think, is what do you do with whom you have in front of you? Mm -hmm. God puts people in our, on our path and what do we do with those people that we have around us? Maybe our neighbors, maybe our family members, some close friends. There's people that are in need of us sharing little bits of what we are so blessed to know and to experience in our life. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we're very embarrassed to do that. From what it sounds like in, in these verses, God would rather have us be kind, be uh, thoughtful and help out an orphan widow than, than to keep the Sabbath, come to church. I mean, I know this verse has been twisted to say that, you know, God no longer, um, you know, God no longer requires Sabbath, but in some sense, the same principle applies that we could come to church every Sabbath, whether, you know, in person or in zoom. And, and if we're not, if we're not having a clean heart, we're not seeking to do good and, and uh, defend the orphan and the widow, then, you know, it might be an abomination to God for us to be doing this. I'll you know, you on, the Sabbath, uh, on the Sabbath day, we could call and check on our, you know, the people that we know might have some need, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the Sabbath is you go to church and forget about the world. We go to church to receive that spiritual meal that we need in order to go out many times. So... Um, if we just go there to look pretty and, and you know, I don't know, show off new clothes and shoes, then mm -hmm. it's really bad, yeah? yeah. Uh, but we go there to, to get the messages that we need. Same as the Wednesday nights, you know, or Friday nights or whatever meetings we have. It's to be reminded and to do something somewhere. Right, right. I mean, the Sabbath should be a reminder to us of what God expects of us. It's not a, it's not a time for us to, um, you know, go through the motions or just to go through the rituals of going to church. 
um, yeah, let's move on quickly. I know we're running out of time. What what does God, you know, God tells us he hates these rituals and, and all that, but but what what does he offer instead? And we read in our memory verse that, you know, we, we our, our sins are, are going to be forgiven. No questions asked. Our sins are forgiven. And instead of our crimson red sins, we become white as snow. Uh, let's jump a few chapters over to Isaiah 44, verse 22, and see what he says here. Somebody can look that up. Isaiah 44, 22. Uh, I have blocked out as a thick cloud, thy transgressions and as a cloud, they sing, thy sin. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So, so those, first, those verses in, in Isaiah 1 are pretty harsh when, uh, if, if you look at it, you know, it, uh, it, it, when God says, you know, I'm, I'm tired of all your worthless offerings, you know, your rulers of Sodom and and people of Gomorrah, it's, it's pretty harsh. I mean, deservedly so, but God doesn't end there. After telling about how he doesn't want them to do rituals, he offers this forgiveness, which is this concept that is um, totally divine. And even though our rituals are worthless and we have sinned greatly, God is offering us forgiveness of just blotting out our sins. And this is the whole message of salvation, that there is no way we would ever earn salvation, not by the sacrifices and the rituals and, and the, uh, the works that we do, but it's a gift that God gives us to blot out our sins and, and, and treat us as if we've never sinned. If we return to him. Mm -hmm. It requires a decision. Um, and it's, it's interesting that not everyone would accept that gift of forgiveness and salvation. Uh, but I, it, it's uh, our choice. Can I go to the, the, the Sabbath day? Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Sabbath day, uh, to me, I always approach that way. Two part. One, Sabbath day is a true, is there, God gave to us. The how could you do it? It's your decision. So I never go into the part two. I always stay in part one, all right? Yeah, but come back here to the 18. 18 is a memory word. Uh, uh, maybe something we would have for, uh, missing something. Uh, if you don't mind, go to the Friday. Go to discussion number three, okay? Now, there is a talk about something, same thing, if you're not same thing, similar, okay? Now, right here, you had the uh, option A is uh, uh, forgiveness before, okay, okay, all right. Uh, okay, transform transformation before forgiveness, A. Then you have forgiveness before transformation, B, all right? So then he asked about, do you, what do you know? But I think uh, I changed to one, what do we do, okay? Make it easier, more practical. So uh, I, I, I let you share your opinion, you know, how you're gonna do it, handle this uh, uh, issue. But i give you an example. The Catholic, you know, they always put the forgiveness, confession number one. If they don't do that, they cannot sleep. If they don't do that, they think they are hopeless. So they emphasize the forgiveness and uh, all the things first. They go to the church, do that every day. Sometimes even more than one day. Now, but for us, what do we do? Are we gonna do the forgiveness first or transformation first? What we think, what we gonna do? Don't think about what God does, okay? What God does, we may not know how it works, but this is how we do it. We gonna emphasize forgiveness or emphasize on transformation? Which one come first? I think transformation. <laughs> 
Hey, Jesse, you are good. I, I agree with you, okay? Now, now this is okay. my, 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 uh, my uh, belief, okay? You don't have to believe it. Uh, some people will argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you, okay? I say you're good. You're good. You're good. Well, well I think that we actually have to wrap up in the next few minutes, and I think it's something for us to ponder. I think it, it might it might depend on how you define forgiveness. Forgiveness is not any kind of uh, activity or work that you do to earn forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift that's given to you. So if you define it that way, I think that comes first. God forgives you, and then he can trans you have to accept his forgiveness, then he can transform your life. It's not, it's not something that you do as an action item. But um, I know that's up for discussion, and I don't think that we have all the answers here. <laughs> go on to, to um... can, I, can I say 10 seconds? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, actually, according to the teachings of Bible, uh, the process is, is, is four, four, four. The first one is you have to believe that Jesus is your savior. And the second, Jesus said, repent, because you know that, that it's sin that keep you from God. So second is repent. Third is to be baptized. What happens when you get baptized? The Holy Spirit transform you and give you spiritual gift. So the process and, 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 and the process is, is first uh, faith, repentance, and then transformation by the Holy Spirit. That's that's what uh, Jesus teaches. Yeah, I think I think God's forgiveness is always there. He is willing to, but He's yes. waiting for us. So you. when I said, see, since you, He gave only two words, uh, <laughs> it's, it's us going to God, and then God is happy to take us in. He said there, if you would change your ways, you know, He's ready. He will, you know, you become like a new person. You have, to, we have to you have to repent. You have to go to God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one <laughs> final one final thought. Um Isaiah, this this such this um this lesson kind of ends with God's promise, I guess. Uh after he talks about you know forgiving and, and be, making our sins white as like wool. Um, verses 19 and 20, I find are interesting. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. So it makes it very simple that if you obey God, well, if you, you, you will be rewarded. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Um, that sort of makes God's love sound conditional. And, you know, we don't believe it is. So I think you have to put this in the context of, of what, what God is saying through the whole book of Isaiah. And you know, his through his message of the whole book is that he's he's gonna forgive all the sins, he's gonna save people. Um, but in the meantime, you know, they, they go through quite a bit of hardship and strife um, because of their sins and their apostasy. Uh, and then of course we just know that God has, you know, how much has God tried to love and save his people? So much that he gives his only son to come and die for us and die a, uh, uh, a criminal's death on the cross. I mean, that just it shows the measure that we can't comprehend of his love and his willingness to, um, to pay the ultimate price to save us. So um, I, th these were the questions I think we already talked about. So something for us to think about and, and ponder and pray about during the coming week. Um, I'm going to close with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll return back to the main session. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together again on another Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing us to 2021. Um, thank you for helping us study your word and help us to understand the message from Isaiah to the people at his, during his time and, and to help us to apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>